Okay, so I started the recording. So officially welcome to uh, Trick Stops December webinar. Uh, tonight we will be talking about how avoiding emotions leads to hair pulling. As, as it goes, usually I will be talking for about 45 minutes and then afterwards we will go to the Q&A. Uh, before I begin, in case you haven't noticed, there's a poll that's active so that you can vote for the topic in January. Uh, if there's a topic that you would be interested in hearing about, but it's not listed there, uh, use the Q&A button and then just suggest a topic uh, along with your questions, of course. And then I will put it on the list next time so that you can vote for it. Every time I form the list based on what you suggest and the questions that you ask, so if there's something that you feel should be up there, feel free to suggest it. So let's get started. So here are our topics for, for this evening. Uh, so first we will define what avoidance is and what is it that, that I mean when I, when I say avoiding emotions. Uh, we will talk about uh, why, would, why would we choose to avoid certain things instead of face them. And uh, we'll, then we'll talk a little bit about implicit assumptions about emotions, uh, because it's these implicit assumptions that lead us to choose avoidance. So it's really important to investigate them. Uh, then we'll be talking about consequences of avoidant behavior. And then we'll talk about acceptance and why acceptance is important. Acceptance would be kind of an antidote to avoidance. And then we'll talk about how to change the way we, we relate to our feelings and what would be a healthier approach to difficult experiences. After this, as always, we will go to the Q&A section. Okay, so let's start by defining terms. And let me first move myself in the corner here so that you can actually see the letters. So this is a definition of experiential avoidance given by Hayes, who is uh, the founder, or at least one of the founders of acceptance and commitment therapy. So he says the following, uh, experiential avoidance is the phenomenon that occurs when a person is unwilling to remain in contact with particular private experiences. So different body sensations, emotions, thoughts, memories, or behavioral predispositions. And not only that, but a person also takes steps to alter the form or frequency of these events and the contexts that occasion them. This is a bit of a mouthful of a definition, and we will have a few of these today, so I will make sure to simplify it. So let's start with the beginning. So when you say that you're unwilling to remain in contact, I think it's much more useful to see what is it that a person is willing to do. A person is actually willing to undertake all sorts of things in order to minimize, alter, or in some other way change uh, their experience. So you don't want to deal with what's in front of you, and then you try to somehow fuzzy up the image that you have so that you don't really have to understand it or deal with it. When we talk about private experiences, this is also an important thing. We're talking about all our experiences. This is why I often use the term feelings to kind of encompass all of that. So we're talking about different body sensations that might be very difficult to bear. For example, people who struggle with anxiety will, will sometimes talk about all kinds of things like this tension in the body or um, your heart racing or the kind of squeezing sensation in your chest that's extremely difficult to be with. So that's something that people might avoid. Then obviously emotions, all kinds of thoughts, memories, uh, behavioral patterns that we have and that we might employ in certain situations. We sometimes tend to avoid those situations so that we wouldn't act in a certain way. Uh, avoidant behavior is not only related to, let's say, mental health issues. It's something that we do all the time. Hair pulling is one way, is, is one form of, of avoidant behavior, and I will explain in detail why and how. But this is likely not the only form of avoidant behavior that you have. So how many times you've watched Netflix so that you wouldn't feel certain things or procrastinated by scrolling through social networks so you wouldn't have to work. All these are different ways of, or different forms of avoidant behaviors. So it's something that's quite present in our lives. 
So let's start by, by asking ourselves if avoidance causes problems for us, why on earth would we choose to avoid something? Um, this question actually arises very frequently in psychotherapy, even with topics that are not specifically hair pulling, because people often seem to choose things that cause them a lot of harm. And if we were guided by kind of conventional logic, why would we choose something that causes harm? And as, as, I, as is often the case, or almost always the case, I go to Kelly for answers. And so uh, one part of Kelly's theory deals with how we make choices, and it's called the choice corollary. And this is what he says here. He says, a person chooses for himself or herself that alternative in a dichotomized construct through which he or she anticipates the greater possibility for extension and definition of his or her system. Like I said, this is going to be a webinar with quite a number of these complicated definitions. So let's just summarize. You come to a crossroads. You can go left or right. That will be the situation of choice. So on the left, there is the choice to face certain difficult emotions. And then on the right, there is the choice to avoid them by pulling. The question arises, why is it that pulling wins out over facing difficult emotions. And Kelly says that this is not because it's more logical, because it's more, because it's more pleasant, because it's, it's better in some way. He says it's because the choice of pulling allows you to extend and better define your system, meaning you will create better anticipations. And you create anticipations so that you can control events in your life. Essentially, what Kelly says is that when we have a choice between clarity and confusion, we always choose clarity. We don't choose things that necessarily feel good or that are nice or even ethical. We choose what gives us better vision. So that would mean, in a certain sense, that pulling gives you more clarity than facing emotions. Uh, just a few more details on this. I'm not going to read the whole text. This is uh, this is a part of the of the text from the Personal Construct Theory Encyclopedia. Uh, it's available online for free, so you can Google it. I will just focus on the three things that I uh, marked here in red. The so one when we talk about choosing avoidance or choosing pulling over something else or choosing whatever over whatever else, I don't necessarily mean choosing consciously. Uh, we often tend to reduce our entire being to what we choose and think consciously. But that obviously isn't the case, because if it were the case, we probably wouldn't be here. So we make a lot of choices unconsciously. Sometimes this is because certain things, we don't like to think about ourselves in a certain way. So when you push things to a more unconscious level, you're free to say, well, it's not me. I didn't choose this, right? And in certain other instances, it's because making unconscious choices is just more efficient. So for example, if you go out for a walk, or for example, right now, I don't have to make a conscious choice to inhale and exhale as I talk, because if I had to, my life would be much more complicated and I probably wouldn't be able to, to think and talk and breathe at the same time. It would just require too much. So it's kind of practical to make it unconscious. So we make a lot of these every day. Like when you go to the fridge, open the fridge, choose something. It's not necessary. Uh, I see that you're raising your hands. Uh, please type the question in the, in the Q&A. I will take a look at them as, as soon as I'm done with the, this main part of the webinar. And I will answer all of them, of course. So choices are not necessarily conscious. The reason why I'm emphasizing this is because Whenever I talk about choices in therapy, people seem to think that I'm implying blame or guilt in some way, but I'm not. For me, there's a big difference between guilt and responsibility. The fact that something is a choice, even if it's not a conscious choice, only means one thing, which is we're responsible to deal with the consequences of our choices. But when we talk about guilt, we usually talk about unnecessary self-punishment. And this is really not my business because it doesn't make anyone's life any easier. The second thing I would like to emphasize here is that we do not choose between what is logical. And this is extremely important 
to remember. Because one thing that I hear very often when people think or talk about their emotions is that they say that they are somehow irrational or, or just crazy or incomprehensible. This is because if we look at things on a superficial logical level, sure, all emotions seem wacky. However, emotions have a logic on their own. They arise from our experience. So what we choose from is not what's logical to choose from, it's, it's what our experience allows us to conceptualize. There's an example here that a therapist might suggest to a client that they should be more assertive. So just to kind of directly communicate their needs. Assertive communication tends to be very efficient, so I can imagine a therapist proposing this. However, let's say that the client's experience doesn't quite accommodate for the idea of assertive. Let's say that the client grew up, I'm making the client up now from, from the text here. So let's say that the client grew up with a very aggressive father. And then the client has a choice between being aggressive, or as he says here, unforgivably aggressive, like the client's father, or miserable and submissive. So when, when a therapist says, well, you should maybe try being more assertive, what the client hears is not the logic that the therapist is implying. The client hears things through his own lens, through this construct where you're either aggressive or submissive and miserable. And then obviously, in order to avoid being like the aggressive father, for example, the client will choose to be miserable. And on the surface level of things, this might not make any sense to people, but from the personal experience of that client, it makes much more sense to be miserable because then you're not this unforgivably aggressive person. So what seems, what seems irrational on the surface actually makes a lot of sense when you look at the context and the context is what, the, what lived experience provides for us. And then the third thing is more or less just a reiteration of what, what I read on the previous slide, which is that we choose that option which allows us to anticipate future events in a more efficient and precise way. Again, that means that choosing hair pulling over anything else is what gives you more clarity, better vision, better possibility of anticipating the future. Simply, that's a part of your personality that's better elaborated. I'm going to give you an example here. Uh, this is not a client, so, uh, and this is also not the, the person's name. This is. Um, so this is a story or, or like a, a something from, from my neighbor. So he's also a friend and he's a workaholic. And when I say workaholic, I mean just nuts. Uh, so that it happened so many times that he would come over and like there's a bunch of us from the neighborhood that we kind of hang out together. And then he would come over and let's say for dinner or just to be with us. And then he would work while he's with us. The man always works. And we kind of started making these jokes all the time that Josh just cannot stand being bored. And so one time when he came over, there was a stack of um, these kinds of cards like you see on the picture here, because I was giving this workshop on how to use works of art to clarify your own emotions and basically your own experiences that are difficult to articulate with words. So my, my living room table was full of these. And he started flipping through and he said, oh, these are very interesting, what are they? So I explained and he said, well, you know, maybe one day we can do something like with me, maybe I can try this out. And then I said, you know, say no more, sit. And so I told him, let's, let's do it. And then we chose to explore boredom. So I gave him a stack of these images and I told him to select several images to just kind of go through all of them and select a few that basically kind of illustrate boredom for him. So to find images that correspond to how he feels boredom. So I left the room and gave him some space to work, came back, he didn't find anything. Then I came back again, he still didn't find anything. And then eventually I came back and there were these three images on the table in this specific order. And so I asked him how they relate to boredom and if he can tell me a story. So why is it that he chose specifically these three? so that I can understand a little bit about his experience of boredom. So the first two actually relate to boredom. The third one relates to avoidance. And this is why I selected this as an example. So he tells me that there's this hypothetical situation where he comes back from work 
and then he comes home and there's nothing to do because he's done with all his work. So he sits. And then suddenly he starts thinking about things. And then he starts thinking about other things and other things and other things and starts kind of replaying uh, things that he needs to do or thing that he, things that he's already done and so on and so on. And then he says that his thoughts are pretty much like these three heads on the first image. If you see, basically these heads are located in something that looks like a silhouette of a, of a human. And so he says that these thoughts kind of start spinning around his entire body and then because he keeps spinning them over in his head, they go faster and faster and faster. So eventually they start hitting the, the boundaries of his body, creating all kinds of body sensations. So essentially what he's describing here is how ruminations cause anxiety, except that he doesn't have the vocabulary to describe it. So he's using the image. And then he says at one point, they start going around his body so fast that it seems like his body is too small to contain all the noise. So he says, instead of thoughts, he ends up with screaming. And this would be the second image where you have this person, I guess, entity being kind of stuck in this shell or egg or whatever it is, and it's screaming because it's too tight. And so that's what boredom feels for him. And then he says at that point, he feels like he's going to explode. So he always starts working. And then the illustration of work would be this person kind of focusing on playing the, the instrument that they have in their hand. And so I asked him to tell me sort of what happens with all the voices and the screaming and the noise in his body as he, um, as he starts playing. And he says, I don't know, I don't hear it anymore. And that's pretty much the definition of avoidance, only in kind of more practical terms. Because he didn't say it goes away. He didn't say, I turn it into music like, like this person does on the image. He says, I don't hear it anymore because I'm focused on something else. And that's exactly how avoidance works. We focus, we do something so that we wouldn't focus on what we really should be focusing. Because what my friend described here is quite intense, but because he ignores it so much and because he focuses on work instead of the, the noise in his own body, he doesn't really quite even know what is it that he's avoiding anymore. It's just this amorphous mass of sensations and jumbled up thoughts. So he runs away from something and over time, he kind of forgot what that even is. So now we're going to talk a little bit about implicit assumptions uh, related to emotions. If, this, if there's something that's not clear from this example or anything else, uh, just ask away and I will get to your Get to your questions. So I will I will show you a few lines that I've uh, received from from clients that I've worked with over the years, where they pretty much summarize what they believe about their emotions, um, and then I will tell you what the consequences of these implicit assumptions are and why it's important for us to figure out what ours are. I didn't provide any sort of comprehensive list for the mere reason that these lists just make no, make no sense because our assumptions arise from our experiences, from families, cultures, so they can be literally anything. I've chosen several here that I hear very frequently, but you might have different assumptions. So it's very important that you investigate your own, try to put them into words, and then see how they dictate the way you relate to your emotions. So here's one example. Uh, my emotions are just irrational. What's the point of listening and trying to understand something that makes no sense? They need to stop and that's it. So the implicit assumption that this client has is that the emotions that she has are irrational. So think about this now. If you choose to conceptualize something as being irrational, you're actually saying that there's no, that there's no logic to this. And if there's no logic to this, then there's no way of understanding it. And that likely means that it also means nothing. So if you have an assumption that your emotions are irrational, you're very likely to actually avoid them because what else do you do with something that makes no sense, has no logic, purpose, or order? You can only ignore it. There's another assumption here, which is they need to stop and that's it. Basically, she also has this assumption that she should be able to control her emotions. 
And this assumption is just on the face of it completely useless because it's really a fact of our experience that we cannot control our emotions. We can sometimes choose what thoughts to think, but we cannot even control our, all our thoughts. And emotions, no way. We can choose how we relate to them and what we do with them, but there's no way to make yourself feel anything in the long run. So here, if you, if you assume that they're irrational, of course, you're going to ignore them. What else? So let's, say, let's take a look at another one. I'm just hardwired that way. It's biology. You're asking me a question that makes no sense. Of course, I'm avoiding them. We're biologically programmed to avoid what's unpleasant. There's no way around it. So this is also a very frequent assumption that I hear from people. They will come to therapy and then they will say something like, well, the condition that I have is just biological. And then I always ask myself, it, it seems like they don't entirely believe it because otherwise they wouldn't be in therapy. Like, why would you come to therapy to talk about something that's genetic? It's kind of like talking your way into a different haircut. Well, not really, you know, it doesn't work. But so one of the reasons that I'm mentioning this is because I don't object to our emotions having a biological basis. I'm not nuts. So I did go to medical school, so I'm well aware that it exists. But it's also a very common fact of our experience that we, that we change, that our feelings change over time. So it's not, so for example, you love someone and you stop loving someone. It's not like you were biologically programmed to love someone for 10 years, but then once year 11 comes, genes just shut off, right? So love might be biological, but then who you love and why you love them and why you stop loving them most certainly isn't. So even if you think that your emotions might have some sort of biological foundation, what you feel and what you do with your feelings is still pretty much your choice. But if you think of them as just being biologically programmed, then you can conveniently also write them off and say, I don't really have to deal with this. I just need to just numb myself or dissociate myself, avoid them, ignore them, or just medicate my myself until I don't have them because it's just biological. And also I think oftentimes when people conceptualize something, and I'm not talking about doctors here, I'm talking about clients. When they conceptualize something as being biological or neurological or whatever phrase that kind of fits that box, they will usually kind of use that that, that assumption as kind of relinquishing them from responsibility to deal with something. It's like, it's not my fault that I have blonde hair. You know, nothing I did about that. And so there's another assumption here, which is that we're biologically programmed to avoid what's unpleasant. Well, there you go. That's pretty much like on the face of it, justification to avoid. It's a direct guideline to avoid. Then again, you can have this assumption that you're hypersensitive. How can I face my emotions when I'm just hypersensitive as a person? I can't handle it. I can only distract myself, but I can't handle. I don't even know what it means to handle. Um, my assumption here is my, my sort of my idea, I maybe um, highlighted the wrong word here. A lot of people are, are hypersensitive, but as a psychotherapist, when you say I'm hypersensitive, what I hear is that you're telling me that you don't really have appropriate coping mechanisms. You don't have any, you don't have good assumptions to understand your emotional responses. So you react to them perhaps more than you think you should. But when you say that you're hypersensitive as a person, that tends to be slightly essentializing. So it's kind of like saying, I'm a failure instead of I failed at something. If I failed at something, that just means that I failed. So I can assess what I did wrong and then learn from it. But if I see myself as a failure, as a person, that sort of speaks to something that's fundamentally me and mine. Like it's a property that I can't, it's like saying humans, or at least most humans have two kidneys or like humans have one liver. That's that level. It's not something that's changeable. So when you say I'm hypersensitive and that's just who I am as a person, you're essentially saying, I have no choice but to avoid. I can't learn this because that's who I am as a person. I can't, uh, I can't handle it. I can't do anything because I am hypersensitive as a person. So the, the, problem is not, um, the problem is not in the fact that someone sees themselves as being hypersensitive. The issue is that when you 
call yourself essentially a hypersensitive person, you're basically saying this is my nature and since it's my nature, you know, not much I can do except avoid. And then there's, there's this one that tends to cause a lot of trouble in therapy. I see myself as a positive person and that's the only thing I want to let into my life. There is no space for the bad stuff because I want the good stuff only. I deserve to be happy. Uh, I mean, other than this uh, kind of like spice of entitlement in the end, th the beginning is what's actually troubling because the other examples that I gave are sort of very simple statements that say, this is the theory that I have because this is what I think is true. So when someone says my emotions are irrational, I can say, okay, and then I can maybe through conversation offer an explanation for certain emotional responses. And then the person might say, oh, look, this makes sense actually. So let me consider your theory. So it's basically like in science, you have a theory, you get evidence that contradicts it. So you have to change your theory. But here, this is a slightly more postmodern twist and assumptions because this person doesn't say, I am essentially a positive person and there's no way around it because I'm, it's biologically you know, burned into my genes. They say, I see myself as a positive person. They kind of have this idea that identity is not something fixed and permanent and essential, that it's just a complex of theories that we have about ourselves. So they choose to see themselves as a positive person. Now, in theory, there's nothing wrong with this because we do this basically all the time. It's more or less all we do in social space is just find different ways to identify and interact with other identities. The trouble here is that you only see yourself as a positive person. That means that you have to write off all those aspects of your personality that don't fit this image of positivity. And unfortunately, I see this so slowly becoming a cultural trend to the point that I've started kind of catching myself thinking how toxic this optimism and positivity is because it directly kind of gets you to discard all those aspects of your experience that are maybe unpleasant or difficult or simply bad. If you want the good stuff only, that means that you will write off you know, 80% of who you are as a person. And if you say, I deserve to be happy, in, in, in the context of this client specifically, it also meant that that for her, it wasn't, for him, sorry, it wasn't about, um, wasn't about achieving happiness or doing something to be happy, but rather kind of wanting the world to, to, to make him happy, which sadly, in my experience, world rarely cares to do. So the, 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 troubling, the troubling thing with this one is that you choose almost consciously to kind of write off a good part of your experience. So our, to summarize this briefly, our implicit assumptions about emotions determine how we handle them and what we do when they arise. So implicit assumptions give us tools to handle our emotions. In order to understand why you avoid facing difficult experiences, uh, you can direct your attention towards these Im implicit assumptions and see what they say about the nature of emotions as you as you think it, they are. And think of Kelly's corollary. He says, I mean, applying it to emotions, he says, we choose to handle emotions in a way that allows us to act with more reliability and predictability. Again, we come to the point that avoidance is more advantageous because it gives you tools that you otherwise wouldn't have. But if you look at these assumptions, you can clearly see that they don't actually ever allow you to create any tools because in order to create tools and, and theories about something, you have to face that something. It's like in science, you have to do experiments and try different things and then you get results. And then based on these results, you, you question, change, contemplate, you know, come up with different and new theories. But if your current theories say, stay away from this you know, unpleasant stuff bad, then you never actually get a chance to create those tools. So let's summarize what we have so far and how this cycle of avoidance leads to hair pulling. We'll start with the smaller circle, the, the whatever color this is, like this kind of peach color. So it always, it usually starts with certain kind of distress, which obviously causes a lot of 
um, difficult emotional responses. They can be external. You can have an argument with someone. You can have a bad day at work or whatever. Anything can happen outside. But they can also be internal. You can have a memory, especially if, you, if you're dealing with trauma or PTSD. Chances are that you will sometimes have flashbacks or simply unpleasant memories that will cause you to feel distress. So this is where the cycle starts. So your body starts becoming excited because that's what happens when you start experiencing uncomfortable things. And then once you kind of start perceiving at least unconsciously what's happening, implicit assumptions get activated and then they tell you. They tell you, okay, so distress, we don't do distress. Uh, cooling is the answer. That way you get to kind of do something else so that you don't have to think about what's arising inside of you. But at the same time, cooling, a lot of people will describe that cooling provides a certain kind of relief or release or relaxation, has this soothing effect, which means that it allows you to kind of channel the physical arousal that, that happens in your body when you're, when you're experiencing intense emotions. So it has the effect of removing you mentally from whatever is difficult, and it also calms you down physically. And it's the implicit assumption that tells you that you should be doing that. And with most adults, it's, it's not even a process that you have to think about consciously. They just fire off automatically, basically. These implicit assumptions can come from family, culture, or personal experiences from all kinds of places. So they lead to, to hair pulling as a form of avoidance. You experience relief and gratification. And as your body calms down, so that feels good, you realize that the memories, thoughts, or whatever else is also not on your mind anymore. And then you think, oh, well, this felt good. So, the, so avoidance is kind of reinforced by its own consequences. And this is a very tricky thing because it causes this cycle to repeat itself. Because once you feel better in the moment, of course, at least for a fraction of a second, that, enough, that in itself is validating. As we all know, very often after this relief and gratification, there's a wave of shame or guilt, but these usually developed afterwards. So after a while, after pooling has been maintained for a period of time. So you can have relief and shame at the same time, basically. Uh, shame kind of lowers your self-esteem, increases the stress, triggers more hair pulling. And at the same time, the gratification also triggers more hair pulling because it validates the whole cycle. So both relief and gratification and shame and guilt and these negative emotions contribute to the cycle kind of going again and again and again. I hope that, that this is clear to you because this is maybe the most important thing that, that I have to share with you, because it really illustrates very clearly how the mechanism works. So it's very hard to stop, if you want to break the cycle, it's very hard to stop the cycle with distress, because, well, I don't exactly know how is it that we eliminate sources of distress. No, that doesn't usually work. Uh, relief and gratification are usually there because pulling soothes you, so that's something that arises naturally out of the process. So that's also a difficult place to intervene, intervene, but where you can and where you can change quite a lot is in this kind of second purplish bubble, which is where these implicit assumptions are. If you, if you change the assumption, the guideline for acting, you can, can change the, the whole cycle, stop it, redirect it, or do something else. Uh, so for example, when we do habit reversal training, which is something that we talked about last month, uh, we, ba we basically, um, because that's a behavioral intervention, so in itself, it doesn't include any cognitive work or any deep kind of psychological work. We act on the avoidance. So we try to leave as much of the gratification as possible. And then we kind of embed new behaviors uh, between, between the, the purple circle and the green circle. And when we change the way we think in, I don't know, acceptance and commitment therapy or any other kind of talk therapy, we're usually working with both the behavior and also the implicit assumptions. And I guess it's clear from this that in the long run, it's the implicit assumptions that need work. 
So what are the consequences of avoidance? There are, of course, short-term and long-term consequences. Short-term consequences are, like I said just now, relief and gratification. Uh, long-term consequences, sometimes there's also a sense of achievement. Uh, if you're pulling only specific hairs, that there's usually a kind of sense uh, of accomplishment because your hair is now the way you want it to be. But that also depends on where you pull and things like this. And, but in the long run, avoidance tends to generate more avoidance as we saw on the previous slide. And then it results in exacerbation of those experiences that we initially tried to avoid. Avoidance prevents us from getting to know ourselves since it hides important aspects of our experience from our, for, from our conscious minds. Uh, if you remember the example that I gave for my neighbor, Josh, that basically he's talking about his body screaming and being very difficult, intense, and almost unbearable. But when you, when you ask him, so, if it's screaming, so what is it telling you? Like if I'm screaming at someone, it usually involves words, you know, scattered between unarticulated sounds, but nonetheless, it involves words because I'm screaming tries to convey a message. And then he said, I don't know. And the truth is that when you avoid something for so long, when you repeat the cycle so many times, you know, you no longer even look at what you're avoiding. It becomes so, uh, so automatic and seamless that you don't really know what is it that you're avoiding. And you would think that this would make things somehow better, but it actually makes them worse because when you don't know why you're what you're avoiding, it becomes even scarier because it becomes this kind of fuzzy conglomerate or all of all these intense and difficult emotions. It's like this kind of soup of all kind of psychological, you know, trash, my word, but it becomes scarier. And the scarier that it gets, the more you avoid it. And the more you avoid it, the scarier it gets. So you kind of make the experiences even worse. What was, let's say, three out of 10 in the beginning of the avoidance cycle, at some point after becomes five out of 10. And then when it repeats again, it becomes nine out of 10. So basically like a piece of rock becomes a mountain over time. There's no need to explain how much distress this actually causes. Um, I would like to talk just for a second and it's of course, related to avoidance about the artwork here. This one and the next several uh, prints that I've uh, used for the slides are done by this Cuban uh, printmaker called Belki Sayon. Um, she's unfortunately, she passed away in the late 90s. She was very young. And her art actually deals with the topic of avoidance quite a lot. Um, she, was, uh, she was inspired uh, by this, um, so let me start from, from the end. So in one of her last interviews, she talked about what art means to her and why is it that she, that she makes art to begin with. And so what she said that for her, art is a way to kind of bring to the surface all these dangerous and difficult things that you cannot possibly live with while they're inside. So instead of avoiding what's inside of her, she puts it out and then she can look at it and face it. So for her, art was kind of healing from avoidance in a way. Uh, the way that she did it in, in terms of the, the symbolic language that she used is that she created all these prints that illustrated a secret society. I guess it's fair to call it a religion as well, a secret society that still exists in Cuba and I assume in Florida. It's called Abaqua. Uh, it belongs to those uh, Yoruba religions that came in the, to Cuba in the 19th century with the slave trade. And uh, it's a society that only accepts men. Uh, they have their own special language and dances and, and all this. So there's this whole esoteric system. And the reason why I say, it, uh, I say it's esoteric is because we know nothing about it because it's, it's obviously a secret. So she was a woman, so she couldn't belong. Um, you know, so there was like, and, and also it's very patriarchal and it's kind of oppressive. So for her excavating and using these images was bringing about all these difficult and for her oppressive secrets to the surface. So it was, instead of being afraid of something you don't know, she would depict it in her artwork and therefore make it manageable, give it proper names and proper visual symbols. And her art, I find it to be completely fascinating. It's very, I don't know, it's kind of disturbing, isn't it? 
I guess that's what makes it so good for me. So where do we see avoidance as, as being one of the, the core issue of one of the core issues? So hair pulling and skin picking are obviously examples of this and all other body focused repetitive behaviors. Addiction is basically a textbook example of avoidance. Uh, think not just addiction in terms of you know, heroin addiction or something as severe as that. It's also smoking is also a form of avoidance as is alcoholism. Uh, think when is it the people go out to smoke? When they're upset at someone, when they're nervous, when they had an argument, when, when they feel like procrastinating. So avoidant behavior. When is it that, that drug addicts tend to use drugs? It's when there's a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety, when life becomes very difficult. So it's a way to alleviate pain and, and suffering by kind of avoiding, avoiding it or separating yourself from it by using, using certain drugs. A panic disorder can also be an example of avoidant behavior. Generalized anxiety disorder is, I guess, also a consequence of avoidance. Agoraphobia and all other phobias are really very literal examples of avoidance. And OCD as well, with its, with its tendency to put things into neat boxes, to arrange everything, make everything predictable, is also a way to avoid anxiety and, and unknown and, and fear of loss of control. So kind of avoiding those areas of life. So all these have in common is that they have this issue at, at, at its core, that certain experiences are to be avoided at all costs. Uh, so this is another important point. So if you take away anything from the from the webinar, it's the, the cycle that I described, and it's this sentence here. It's quite simple and easy to remember and you know, write it everywhere. Pain is inevitable and suffering is not. So this is a quote from uh, Hanepala Gunaratana, who is um, a Buddhist monk, and he wrote, if you, if you ever want to start mindfulness and you don't mind, you don't mind Buddhist language, it, the book is called Mindfulness in Plain English, and I think, for me, it's probably the best manual of meditation for beginners. Uh, the reason why it's good is because I read it many times over the years, and whenever you read it, there's this sense that the author is actually a very accomplished meditation master. Often when I read books written by um, by Westerners, I get sometimes this impression that the book is written to be sold, not because they've practiced for 30 years and then have a lot of experience to share. And with this book, it's, it's evident in every page. But let's go back to the quote. So, pain is inevitable, suffering is not. If we substitute pain with distress, because that's the term that I used previously, it means that there's no way to escape distress, but that suffering because of distress is, let's say, optional. So the, um, these first two, I think we kind of went over already. One thing that I would like to point out here is that avoidance in the long run, this is something that I should have put in the long-term consequences, is that it drains us of energy. It's extremely exhausting to avoid things all day. Even when avoidance mechanisms are so efficient that you don't consciously know that you're avoiding things, it's still immensely draining to avoid. This is something that, uh, so uh, experiential avoidance is a term that comes from acceptance and commitment therapy, so a form of CBT, but this is obviously something akin to defense mechanisms in psychoanalysis. And one thing that Freud described, so like over a hundred years ago, uh, is that repression and suppression and all these mechanisms that push away What's, what we deem is unacceptable, that they require a lot of energy. It's basically like keeping someone in a room and then having to keep the door closed all the time. Even when it's so efficient that you don't really know that it's even happening, it still drains you of energy because to, to consciously not know that you're avoiding something takes a lot of effort. And also it kind of, it kind of stops or slows down our growth as people because when you avoid certain uh, feelings or certain memories or certain parts of yourself, you really don't see where your limits are, where your boundaries are, what causes distress. And these are precisely the areas where our development should be directed towards. 
if you change where change is easy and simple, well, that's really not fundamental change. So it's these areas where there's a lot of distress in life that we actually need to grow. So from, from my perhaps slightly upside down and weird point of view, distress in that sense is even welcome because it tells us, look, this is what you need to work on. This is where you need new tools. Uh, this is not the easiest thing for you. So it's essentially information about what about sort of the direction that we need to take in life. The, the very opposite from, from avoidance is acceptance. Um, so acceptance, if, if we define uh, avoidance as being unwilling to, to remain in contact with difficult experiences, then acceptance is willingness to actually seek out these ex experiences and see them clearly. So seeing them clearly is my addition to the definition. The other psychologists use different language. I like this seeing things clearly because that's literally what acceptance is. So when you open up to your experiences and when you accept them, that doesn't mean that you make peace with them. It doesn't mean that you like them. It doesn't mean that you stop changing them. It doesn't mean that you are going to suddenly grow to like them. None of this. But unless you actually look at them and learn how to see them, understand them in details, how do you actually change them? There's very little possibility of intentional change without acceptance. It's like, it's like doing surgery, but just kind of sticking your hands into someone's abdomen without looking at what you're doing. That's exactly what it is. So we change. I mean, there's a, there's a certain likelihood that things will spontaneously change. But even if that happens without acceptance, we cannot really direct that change. The only way to know what you're doing is to accept. So let's see what an accepting approach to distress and difficult emotions would be. So one thing is to swallow this bitter pill and realize that wanting the good stuff only simply is not a sustainable way to go about living because the stress is unavoidable. So I'm experiencing it right now because my back hurts, for example, as I'm talking to this, as I'm saying all this. And my chair is also really uncomfortable, but I didn't have time to change it because I didn't want to be late for the webinar. So I'm experiencing a degree of distress right now. Sometimes when I explain some things, I think afterwards, well, I could have done this better, or I should have talked maybe slower. So it's distressing, but it is unavoidable. But the, the good news is, is that even though it's unavoidable, the stress is also impermanent. If, you're, if you meditate, this is one of the insights that you will eventually over time gain. And it's perhaps one of the most important things that meditation and therapy have taught me, which is that nothing really lasts forever. No matter how unpleasant something is, it will go away. And I actually think of this sentence sometimes when, when things are not going my way. And it really gives me a certain dose of relief when I realize that yes, everything sucks now, but in 15 minutes, it will suck less. And in one hour, it will stop sucking <laughs> because it is impermanent. The same way that happiness is impermanent. No one is happy 24 seven. I don't know how hostile you have to be to reality to even think that you can be happy all the time. Happiness comes and goes. It's one of the ways in which shopping therapy maintains itself by giving us a dose of pleasure and happiness that just evaporates in two days. Third thing is our emotional experiences are just information. They tell you how the stress is affecting you and what is it that you need to develop, improve or use so that you can live a better life, so you can adapt a bit better to your surroundings or so that you can adapt your surroundings to you. Clinging to distress or to positive emotions as well, or pushing them away is what turns distress into suffering because on its own, distress will come and go. But if you push it away, it will keep coming back. And every time you push it away, it takes a little bit of that energy, adds to its own arsenal and then comes back even stronger. 
So pushing away experiences makes them worse, the same way that avoidance makes them worse. Clinging to experiences also causes the suffering because once they start, start disappearing, we tend to be very upset and, and terribly miserable because we want them to stay. So that's one moment when we realize their impermanence, but we want it not to be that way. So we want to change that experience. So we cling even more. And the more we cling, the more we realize that this is going away forever and then causes us to suffer. Essentially, suffering comes when you don't accept things. It's like when you don't, when you try to somehow forcibly modify your experience instead of learning from it and trying to, uh, to change based on that experience. So when we open up to distress, which doesn't sound very intuitive, but that is a healthy thing to do. When we open up to distress, we allow this distress to change us and, 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 and does so in a very constructive way. As opposed to clinging and pushing away, where we not only engage in this futile fight of trying to alter what we cannot possibly control, we also don't change because pushing away and clinging are both ways of defending the status quo. And if the status quo was sustainable, well, you wouldn't be experiencing distress. So how do you get to that point? So first, you need to analyze your behavior and identify as many avoidance patterns as you possibly can. Like I said, hair pulling is an obvious example of a pattern of avoidance, but it is not the only one. So you probably avoid things in a similar way. As you kind of try to learn about your avoidance patterns, you're, you're slowly kind of start seeing a larger picture. You start seeing patterns that were prior to that incomprehensible to you, that you just couldn't make sense of. So even certain aspects of pulling behavior that may puzzle you now can become more clear once you put them in this bigger picture. And this is something that also comes from acceptance because you can see things clearly and then you can see where all the pieces, pieces fall together. The second thing is to figure out what your implicit assumptions are and then see how they affect the way you manage your difficult experiences. This is, okay, someone is screaming in the street, I don't know if you can hear it. So this part, examining your implicit in assumptions sounds like a simple thing because it's just like one simple sentence here, but it's actually quite difficult. Uh, if you remember in the beginning when I was talking about choices, I said that there are certain choices that we make consciously, and then there are those choices that we just make on the go with no conscious awareness. A lot of these assumptions that we have are not that easy to put into words. The reason for this is because we don't really sit, there's no book of assumptions that we, you know, open, check out from the library and then open at home and find assumptions that we like. This is something that we pick up as we go along. So it's not, it's most often not a conscious choice. A lot of therapists, for example, will be able to articulate what their assumptions are, as can I, because we spend a lot of time in therapy and we spend a lot of time, I mean, in our own therapy and in therapy with other people. And we spend a lot of time reading books. So we have a bigger arsenal. We have a better developed language to speak about this. But most of us, when we pick up these assumptions from our family, from from our partners or when they arise from our own authentic experiences or from our culture, it's not something that you can easily put into words. So it might take time and it might take a lot of observations of your behaviors and what you do to reconstruct them. So be patient because they don't reveal themselves that easily. Then it's the, the next step to do is to gather actual information. So if we want to create a healthier relationship with our difficult experiences and distress, then we actually need to know what, what's that all about, right? So once you realize what your implicit assumptions are, you can put them aside and then see what the actual raw data of your experience tells you. When you open up and try to really see what's happening, you will get better information. You will have more to work with. Uh, and then once you do the all three, I guess you don't do them one after the other. They kind of exist as parallel processes. 
you use this information to consciously assemble more sustainable narratives about difficult experiences. And I will give you some examples of how you do this. What's important is that even if our implicit assumptions are really limiting and oppressive and cause a lot of suffering, we don't necessarily have to throw them away. We can and should keep what works and then change the rest because that makes the process less traumatic and also there's less resistance because you're not tossing aside something that actually works for you. Let's just address number three before we go back to number, before number four. So what does it mean to open up? Because I know that I sound like Oprah when I say just, you know, open up to difficult experiences. Just, I don't know, that it sounds, doesn't sound good to me, but it, it's very difficult to otherwise explain what the process is. There are even books about this. There's a book by Pema Chodron that's called Welcoming the Unwelcome. And then there's Radical Acceptance that also deals with this. So opening up means that you can look at your distress and not flinch. So not be disgusted, not be ashamed, not feel any guilt. Just see it as a fact of your experience. It means that you're allowing yourself to be emotionally exposed and therefore vulnerable in the moment because our difficult experiences are our weak spots. So that's a very vulnerable place to be in. And then, and this is easy to type, very difficult to do, you allow yourself to be transformed by this difficult experience. I think one example that we, most of us have in our experience and that relates directly to this is that moment when you want to to say I love you first. If, if you've ever been in that position, you know how difficult, yeah, a lot of you are raising hands right now. <laughs> uh, so I guess it is a familiar experience. It's like that moment when these words are leaving your mouth and you, you're not sure if you want to laugh or cry or just disappear from the face of the earth. When, when you say those words and then there's like a lingering second when you're wondering, am I going to hear them back? that's being vulnerable and emotionally exposed. But that's also a point of growth because when you say those words, there's really a big insight that we overlook, which is, my God, I survived, one thing. And then if you don't hear them back, you survived even that. So there's a lesson in your resilience there, but you can't, but what's important is to stay open and stay vulnerable because that way you get a lot more empirical data about what it feels and what it means. And you really get to kind of diving deep in your own psyche instead of just sticking to the superficial logic. Because if you stick to the superficial logic, then you end up with an idea that all of it was, was irrational, but you really didn't listen to the, to the fine details of the process. And then how do we create sustainable narratives? So uh, rewriting a narrative to begin with has to contain workable strategies. The reason why we want to change our existing implicit assumptions is because they lead to avoidance and that's not healthy and it causes a lot of suffering where it doesn't have to cause suffering. So whatever the new narrative should be, it should contain workable strategies. We can source these, for example, from competing responses or these practical behavioral techniques that we usually use in the beginning of the treatment to gain some control and to minimize damage. It can also involve and should involve, if you ask me, uh, techniques to actually observe your experience mindfully. It should maybe include some sort of education about what our emotions mean in the sense that they each have a message to deliver. So how to understand this message, how to understand them in terms of differentiating one from another, how to differentiate anxiety from guilt, guilt from sadness, sadness from threat and whatever else. So it should contain that practical part. I mean, this is obviously a topic for a webinar in itself. So maybe that's something we can address in the future. Then when we see them as information, that's preferable to seeing them as sources of intrinsic suffering, given that we have no control over them. If we say, okay, this is you know, heavy stuff, it's difficult information, but it's information nonetheless, then you can do something with the information. You can decipher it, you can translate it, you can use it to grow, change, get yourself new tools, whatever you need. If you see it as suffering, and we know empirically that we have no control over conscious control over what we feel, 
you're basically saying, well, I'm bound to suffer forever. So information preferable to seeing something as source of suffering because information is workable, it's practical. Source of suffering is, well, source of suffering, period. Seeing distress as a consequence of our interaction with the world is more sustainable than seeing it as being hurt by the world. Most of us are guilty at some points in our lives of thinking that you know this is being done to us. Like sometimes when I have a bad day, I genuinely have this idea that like why is the why is the universe hating me? Like what did I ever do to the universe? I recycle, you know. I try try to leave a very small carbon footprint, and you reward me with all this nonsense and chaos. So we have this sometimes that we see things as being done to us. But if instead, so this is a very powerless position. It puts us in, in it puts us in this kind of victim mindset, whoever the oppressor is. But when we're when we see ourselves in these moments as being victims, we also see ourselves as being helpless. Because who am I to fight the universe or politics or whatever else may cause suffering? But if instead you see distress as a consequence of your interaction with the world, that's workable and practical. Why do I say this? So let's say a source of distress is something mundane, like um, you do some work for your boss and then your boss doesn't like it. It's a source of distress, but it's also a consequence of the work that you did. So the distress that you feel tells you how much you care. The specific quality of the emotion that arises will tell you whether or not you need to maybe focus on work and do better work or simply find a different way to interact with your boss. Or learn, or learn how to set boundaries with him, or simply find a way to not care about what he says. But you first have to realize the specific flavor of the distress. But if you see all of it as being just pointless attacks by a cruel world, you won't bother because there's nothing that you can do. So experiencing in general, so like this whole whole spectrum of negative experiences, is best seen as learning and as a source of strength. Because no matter how difficult your experiences have been, you have survived. It doesn't matter if the battle was difficult, if the damage was great, but you did survive. So there is strength there. But if you see it all as just this irrational, genetically determined hypersensitivity, then you're very likely not to grow from it. After all, how, how do you grow from, the, from something that's limited by your DNA? There's even research to confirm this. There's a very interesting book uh, by Ellen Langer called Mindfulness, but it's not mindfulness as in mindfulness meditation. It's something slightly different. And she, she, shows, she shows practically through her experimental work, because she's a researcher, uh, how the way we frame things uh, actually makes us act differently, think differently, feel differently, and, and be different. She has this experiment that she did when she gave, she went to this retirement home and gave a certain number of, of people their plants to nurture. And turns out that those people that got their plants to keep alive were healthier and happier because they had something to give them meaning in their day. But there was some structure that arose from this and there was some purpose. And then those that didn't had lower well-being scores. So that actually means that like when there's clear purpose in your life, you do better, you thrive better. There's very little meaning that you derive from seeing yourself as irrational and condemned to being hypersensitive forever. So the way we mentally frame things has really very concrete consequences for the way that we live. She had, her whole book is about her work as a, as a researcher. So I highly recommend that it. it's very entertaining. You can also, there, she has a TED talk and there's, there are quite a number of interviews on YouTube. She's a very interesting lady and very, very smart. So she can give you a lot of empirical validation for what I'm saying here. Uh, so we don't have to, like, if you want to see your emotions as, as fundamentally genetically conditioned, fine. I don't think there's anything wrong with this. But again, the secret is how you twist it. I can say that my capacity to love, like the love as a, as, a, as a specific class of experiences certainly has its biological basis because everything we do or think has some basis in our material bodies because that's what we live in after all, right? 
But there's a difference between, between saying this is the range of human experience that I was given by the virtue of being born human. And, and then now I have to find creative ways to deal with it and saying I'm condemned by this. So you can have these assumptions, it's just how you frame them. Uh, even irrational works to a certain degree. Take a look at the painting on the right. So this is an author, I, I, I really like this artist's work, but I don't know much about her work. So I don't know what, there are some artists like Belkis Ayon or I don't know, De Kooning or Rothko or these people that I know a lot about how they created their art. And then I have a more, let's say, intellectualized knowledge of it. But with this, with her art, I don't know much about her because I just didn't get around to kind of going in depth with it. But when I see this, this, this kind of, uh, quick and, and determined strokes, it makes me feel energized in a way. And is it irrational? Sure, I guess you can explain it away like that. But it doesn't matter because even if the connection between my good mood and her artwork is entirely arbitrary and irrational, it's still there. And what I do with this connection is not, it doesn't have to be irrational. I can, for example, specifically put it on the last or on the last slide of my webinar so that I have, so that I kind of look at it and then feel better and have the strength for the Q&A. So my point being is that even if certain connections are, and, and things about our psychic life are caused by these kind of contingent things, not even just random things, and even if they are fundamentally irrational, they are our experiences and we can use them in a rational way. So you can keep some of these implicit assumptions, but then find a twist to them, a twist that offers you a way out. You can say that, I don't know, you were born hypersensitive and that's your nature as a human, but then you can add the twist that it's also your job and your responsibility to build different coping strategies so that you can work be better with what you're given. So that's uh, the theoretical part. And now we will go to the Q&A, but before we do, let me conclude the poll and then tell you what our topic for January will be. The topic is perfectionism and hair pulling and it won quite handily. Let me see what's the runner up. Oh, the runner up is mindfulness of the body and hair pulling by one percentage point. Oh no, I'm sorry. Coping with anxiety is the runner up. I apologize. So in January, we'll be talking about perfectionism and hair pulling. And then if there are any other topics that you suggested, I will um, put them, um, I will put them on the list in January. So before we go to the Q&A, just a quick word and a thank you to Trickstop for allowing us to meet every month. Um, so Trickstop is an eight week, at least an eight week program based on habit reversal training and acceptance and commitment therapy, both of which are validated treatments for hair pulling. It's a program that's done in writing, so it comes at a fraction of the cost of the traditional forms of therapy. It allows you to, to work with a therapist essentially on a daily basis and to basically grow from the comfort of your own home and completely anonymous because the therapist uh, doesn't see you and doesn't know anything that you don't want to share, which is something that kind of gives you more protection than traditional forms of therapy. Usually we do those consultation calls every month, but now the number of these calls is so great that it's really hard to do all of them. So what we're going to do is something we did last month as well. We're going to create a small webinar next week that will be about half an hour long, not more than that. And all I will be doing in that webinar is presenting the program to you and then answering your questions about the program so that we don't take too much space from the Q&A explaining how TrickStop works. You will receive an email, so you're welcome to join if, if that's something you're interested in. So now let's go to the Q&A. If I could possibly change, okay, there it is, let's go. Uh, how do people diagnosed with PTSD get affected by trichotillomania compared to people without PTSD? I can give you a, an answer in reverse statistically. Um, I would say that, that not many people with PTSD also have trichotillomania, but a lot of people with trichotillomania have PTSD. Uh, 
I'm not sure about why the connection is there specifically, because I have not read any research on the topic, so I can't give you anything that's been, you know, published in a peer-reviewed journal. But I have seen that these two come together quite frequently. In fact, of all the body-focused repetitive behaviors, I would say that hair pulling uh, comes with PTSD more